Good morning. morning. We're so glad to welcome you to Harvard Divinity School. And today's conference focuses on cultivating resilience for chaplaincy. And this project has been sponsored by Harvard Divinity's Office of Ministry Studies and has been developed in cooperation with David Freudberg, producer of the Spiritual Care podcast and also Humankind. The conference has largely been funded by a grant from the Henry Luce Foundation and also is produced in association with the BTS Center. BTS stands for Bangor Theological Seminary, but it doesn't stand for Bangor Theological Seminary anymore. It's just BTS because BTS is no longer in Bangor and it is no longer a seminary. (laughs) It is, however part of our profound support for this conference. We know that many of you have traveled here from very far geographically or otherwise, and we're also welcoming folks who are joining us via live stream. Your presence here today is crucial to our building a community of learning throughout the day, so welcome. I'm Emily Click, and I direct the field education program at Harvard Divinity School, and I also serve on the faculty and lecture on ministry. During my 12 years here, I have seen our students' interest in and commitment to chaplaincy grow almost exponentially. And this increase in investment in chaplaincy might be attributed, in part, to the fact that over the past 15 years or so, Harvard Divinity School has expanded and deepened its already long-standing commitment to prepare our graduates for ministerial service within, yet also beyond any single religious tradition. Our dedication to understanding ministry as work shared across and beyond religious traditions means our graduates are well prepared to serve in institutional contexts such as hospitals, prisons, and within the armed services as well as higher education. Pluralistic understandings are, however, only one reason why so many HDS alums go on to a lifetime of institutional service, often in the role of chaplains. Our students and graduates want to address racial injustice, economic challenges, and to support individuals who serve in the most demanding of contexts such as the armed services. Our students want their work to address human suffering. Our pluralistic orientation as well as our well-developed and ever-evolving arts of ministry designations within field education as well as coursework will serve them well as chaplains. A wonderful curriculum is, however, only part of the toolkit one needs to engage in chaplaincy, where profound human suffering confounds the caregiver's journey. The work our alumni engage requires a lifetime of sustained involvement with problems that defy easy solutions. This kind of work can be thrilling in its satisfactions. Yet chaplaincy also requires accompanying others through shadow-filled passageways. Moments of celebration and great joy frequently are also a part of this work. And this conference is one way we in the Office of Ministry Studies would like to offer encouragement for the chaplain's journey through its many peaks and valleys. And we recognize that listening to and learning from those who have long sojourned in these occupations can never be overdone. Today is therefore first and foremost an opportunity to hear from chaplains who have cultivated their own practices to enable sustained engagement with chaplaincy over time. And we're calling healthy engagement over time resiliency. So today's core agenda, therefore, is to listen to the many ways actual practitioners cultivate resiliency for work over time. This morning, we'll hear from Frank Rogers, whom I'll introduce more fully in a moment. His work in practicing compassion provides a very helpful, concrete way we may all grow toward greater resiliency in whatever role or field we serve. 
Later this morning, we will listen to two seasoned leaders who have cultivated practices of resiliency while leading within institutions. Rabbi Patricia Carlin Newman will reflect on her 20 years plus of service at Stanford University, presently as the Senior Associate Dean for Religious Life. And Sensei Joshin Burns will reflect on his work as Vice Abbot of Upaya's Zen Center, where many Buddhist chaplains come to prepare for service in healthcare institutions. Then in the afternoon, we'll have an opportunity to attend workshops led by chaplains from military, prison, higher ed, and hospital settings. We've asked them to do two things. One is to talk about chaplaincy in their particular context. We also, however, have framed the conference as less about a type of chaplaincy. As you know better than I do, it isn't chaplaincy that is hospital chaplaincy. It's a quality of caring for others, an engagement with others that includes and is based in a quality of caring for self. And therefore, you may want to learn this afternoon, it'll be your choice, from a chaplain serving in a context quite different from the one you might serve in, simply because their insights about resiliency might serve you well as you develop your own understandings. We asked our presenters in advance, what were their definitions for resiliency? As you listen to my excerpts just now from their definitions, I invite you to begin the journey of the day in growing your own understandings of resiliency. For example, one of our presenters shared that resiliency is not so much about bouncing back, but one's ability to stay tough. Another pointed out that if we're engaged in life-giving work and service, that is naturally revitalizing. One wanted to emphasize the capacity to stay connected to the moment, to self, to another, to a higher power, to something greater than oneself. And another pointed out the resilience is the capacity for perspective, meaning making. And they made a note, spiritual resilience is not the absence of spiritual distress or suffering. Another explained the circularity of resilience. Resilience is the ability to return. Returning is the ability to circle back. And circling back is the ability to remember why you began the journey. And remembering the journey is beginning again, at the beginning. To practice resilience is to remember why the journey began. And here is a definition that offers the most succinct one of resiliency. It is cooperating with our primal orientation toward life. Let me make just a few announcements before I introduce our morning speaker. You have the entire schedule in your packets, so I'm only going to highlight right now its overall shape. We will spend our entire morning here in the Sperry Room, and then we'll walk down the hall to the Braun Room at the other end of Andover Hall for our lunch together. And after lunch, we will have two different workshop sessions. That will be followed again by a final hour here in what we call Sperry, the Sperry Room. In fact, our graduates sing a version of In the Sperry Room. I don't know if any of you are ready to sing that for folks. Um, <laughs> it's a hoot. Um, so we'll conclude our day by 4.30. You should know a few things to make you comfortable. First of all, um, I'd like to acknowledge the staff of our Office of Ministry Studies, who have worked very hard to put together every aspect of this program. I'm indebted to many who I will now name, and most of them are out running around and probably won't be here to receive our applause, but we are going to appreciate them. Leslie, way over there in the corner, and <laughs> Laura. <laughs> Carol, who's down the hall, and Sue Ruther. Uh, Fran, who is not here today, but worked tirelessly for weeks, and Sally, who is here today, and greeted you and gave you your name tags and much more. We appreciate their stuffing packets, ordering flowers, arranging for coat racks, thinking in advance what does res resiliency mean, who might present that, who might we invite, and so forth. I also know that Dudley Rose, the Associate Dean for Ministry Studies, joins me in appreciating them and welcoming each and every one of you here. 
we will have abundant food, as you already know and have experienced, and drink offerings at our morning and afternoon breaks, and then a generous and vegetarian lunch, which means you might want to know where to locate the restrooms. <laughs> Down the stairs or elevator. We have an elevator at the end of the hall. Or you can sneak upstairs to the second and third floors, uh, where there's just one restroom on each floor. If you listen carefully, you realize there are no restrooms on this level of Andover. Soon to be renovated, very old building. <laughs> Welcome. Frank Rogers Jr. is the Muriel Bernice Roberts Professor of Spiritual Formation and Narrative at Claremont School of Theology. He offers his wise and skillful gifts for storytelling as part of engaging practical compassion for the good of the world. Along with Professor Andrew Dreitzer, Frank Rogers co-directs the Center for Engaged Compassion at Claremont School of Theology. This center offers unique processes of engaged compassion that transform the desire to help others into practical actions that change the world for good. The center teaches concrete, learnable practices, skills, and perspectives that give individuals, groups, communities, organizations, religious congregations, and governments the capabilities and sensibilities for creating genuine peace, healing, reconciliation, and collaboration through the formation of engaged compassion. Dr. Rogers' research and teaching focus is on spiritual formation that is contemplative, creative, and socially liberative. A trained spiritual director and experienced retreat leader, he has written on the interconnections between spirituality, social engagement, and compassion. He's the author of Practicing Compassion and his supplemental cur curriculum, The Way of Radical Compassion. He's also written The God of Shattered Glass, a novel, and Finding God in the Graffiti, empowering teenagers through stories, which explores the role of the narrative arts, storytelling, drama, creative writing, and autobiography in the spiritual formation of marginalized and abused youth and children. His current project is designing and teaching in the Triptychos School of Compassion, a three-month intensive formation program in the spiritual path of Jesus. I will take a brief prerogative to also say that Frank has been a very important mentor for me. During my doctoral studies at Claremont, he was on my dissertation committee. I count him as one of the most transformative teachers I have ever had the honor of learning from, and therefore join you in turning to him with an open heart to learn even more. Welcome, Frank. going to say, wow, I want that job, and you know, I want to be that person. My goodness, what a <laughs> generous introduction. I'm, I'm really grateful to Emily to invite me here, and uh, to David Freudberg for including me in this wonderful endeavor, and all the people that have uh, uh, supported and, and worked out all the logistics. It's been just a, a very lovely way of being here. So, uh, I also want to express my gratitude to all of you who are chaplains or who are training to be chaplains. You are the ones who are on the front lines. You are engaging with persons who are enduring some of the most extreme circumstances of their lives. They are facing difficult illnesses or death or military encounters. They are facing violence in communities, in schools, incarcerations. And you are present with those folks. And for me, that's a very sacred task. You're helping them all know that in the midst of things that are as tragic and difficult that they'll ever face, they're not alone. You are with them, and as such, you're embodying a sacred care that is with them as well, that sees it all, that holds it all, that sustains them through it all. And that is sacred work. In the last two years, I've had two losses in my life, as different as can be. My mother-in-law, my wife's mother, 90-year-old elder, passing away, encircled by all of her children and their partners, an absolute moment of transcendent grace as she slipped away. And then my little sister, who died alone of despair in a car by herself. 
And in both cases, chaplains were symbols and embodiments of radical care and compassion. I teach people who are becoming chaplains. I was a chaplain in a prison and children's homes. I'm on the board of a CPE training site. I know how this works. And when I am in the midst of grief and suffering, I can still be cut to the core by the caring presence that people like you offer. The woman who came to us at, at my mother-in-law, she had us all in a circle, a literal circle, holding each other. And then, because she had been companioning her for months, knew that the rosary was the most important spiritual practice that she was holding on to, and had us all saying the rosary. We hadn't done that in years, years and years. We were stumbling our way through it. But it was the exact right thing, as her kids are engaging in the practice that kept her alive spiritually. And then when I went to see with my brother-in-law to the hospital to identify my sister's body, and I am shell-shocked with grief, the tragedy so unexpected. And I walk out into the lobby, and here comes this young chaplain. It was clear he had not been a chaplain for long, and he was uncomfortable, and he was very talkative. Oh, I'm so sorry for what you're going through, and I know this must be a hard time. And I just looked at him. I was in a stony stare of shock, just looking at him as his words just washed past me. And then it was like a switch went off, and he got it, and he stopped talking, and he could see. And he says, I got nothing. I just know it's wrong. And it sucks. And I'll sit here with you. And I wept. And he sat with me. This is sacred work that you all do. You are embodiments of care and compassion. And in those moments, it is like you are icons or instruments, channels of whatever sacred energy of compassion permeates through our planet and offer little whispers and glimpses that sustain us. I'm grateful. It's also hard work. It takes its toll being through those types of circumstances on our physical health, our emotional well-being. It can put strains on our relationships. It could even wear away some of the foundations of our, of our own faith and meaning. It is hard work. It's no wonder that statistics range between 40 and 80% of human caregivers will experience the symptoms of burnout or compassion fatigue in the course of their work. It takes its toll on us. And so what I would like to do today is offer some of the things that I've learned about compassion on my journey. The work we do is engaging practices of compassion that are healing and personally restorative and empowering, and also how compassion can be socially and relationally transformative, especially in times of conflict. And some of the things that we're learning about compassion, I think, have implications for caregivers in general and for chaplains in particular. So I want to offer three ways that compassion can be a source of resiliency in the practice of caregiving. The first is that compassion can be a renewing source of our vocational purpose. It's the source of our call. Carrie Backer, one of our PhD students, just completed her dissertation, Dr. Backer now, and she was working with persons who were experiencing secondary trauma, vicarious trauma, burnout, or what has been called compassion fatigue. So she gathered a group of folks who are in the most difficult of circumstances. We're talking about a prison chaplain that works with inmates who've been convicted of sex crimes and people working in hospice, people working in trauma units, uh, people working in, in inner city schools where violence is surrounding the school. And she put them through this program of compassion training. And she discovered several things. First of all, 
It was compassion that inspired each of their vocations in the first place. It was compassion, being moved by suffering or seeing people moved by suffering and the possibility of being able to offer compassionate care that inspired us to get into the work in the first place. She also discovered though that every single one of these persons experiencing secondary trauma had lost touch with their sense of call. They were disconnected from that spiritual resource that gave rise to why they were doing the work in the first place. And the third thing she discovered is in inviting them into practices that reconnected them to their own sources of sacred compassion, restored their own sense of call and purpose, and it mobilized their own resilience. This rings intuitively true to us, right? It is compassion. That is why we do the work that we do. Somewhere along the way, perhaps we were the experiencing compassion from somebody else. You might even think in your own lives, what were some of those lodestars that, that brought you into this work? I'll never forget my youth minister when I was in high school and we were in a family traumatic crisis and he was the one who could, took the time to come and sit with me in the midst of that. I wanted to be like him when I grew up. Or there are sometimes there are mentors in our lives, exemplars of compassion, people who are vocational lodestars that embody the kind of presence we would love to be in the world. I remember also when I was in high school, my grandmother, Italian Catholic, Italian is her first language, English is her second language, which was always with Italian thrown into it. And when our Sunday school teacher came down with, not with AIDS, but at that time it was called GRID, gay-related immune deficiency before they realized that it was uh, blood transfused that went way beyond simply persons who were gay. And he was ostracized from our church. My grandmother took him in. And I watched as she washed his wounds and, and put ointment on his KS lesions. And I said, that's the kind of compassion I want to embody in this world. And sometimes it's when we've encountered suffering ourselves and we're moved by the pain that we see and we ache to be able to offer some kind of healing, sustaining presence in the midst of it. In the midst of all that we do, it's really easy to forget why we do what we do. There are so many people who are aching for our attention in our ministries. There are institutional chaos and complexities that can be distracted. There's all the burdens of our regular lives that we're trying to manage on top of that. And it's very easy to forget, why do we do this? How did I get into this in the first place? What was that renewing, inspiring presence that enabled me to imagine a vocation of caregiving. I remember like it was yesterday, one of those moments that really inspired my own call. I was in college, I was all of 20 years old, I was a religious studies major and I had to do a summer internship. And so I found this working class church in southern uh, South San Francisco and uh, for the summer I was the summer intern. And in that, those particular locations, when you're a summer intern, it gives the pastor an opportunity to go on an extended vacation. <laughs> so for six weeks, uh, I was the only pastoral presence within this congregation, and that was okay. I mean, I thought I can do this, and so I'm, uh, I'm getting my sermons written, and I've got Sunday school classes and the whole bit, and one day, I drive up to the church. It's a Saturday morning, and I got a finishing touches on the worship bulletin for the next day, and as I get there early in the morning, here's this 11-year-old boy who's already there waiting for somebody to drive up. He's got ripped up blue jeans on. He's got this, this army trench coat. His hair is all frizzled out. And as I come up, he comes running over. And he says, excuse me, as I'm getting out of the car, are you the priest? I go, well, no, I, I'm, I'm the summer intern. <laughs> 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 well, well, that's OK. Will you come down to our house? Something terrible happened last night, and we have nobody to talk to. My brother, he just killed himself, and my mom is alone in her living room. 
Five minutes later, I'm pulling up in front of this house. The paint has been peeling off of the side. There's grass has long since turned to dirt. There's strewn automobile parts all across the yard. And I walk into this living room where here is a mother who is looking, staring vacantly down the hallway into the bedroom where her 16-year-old boy had taken a handgun and realized that life was just too hard. I have no idea what I said or what I did. I just remember being in the presence of unimaginable grief. What I do remember is when I left. And Tony, the 11-year-old, he says, hey, can I drive back to the church with you? I said, of course. We drive back up. I invite him into my office. He says, no, no, let's just sit out here. And we start talking. And that's when I realized what was going on with this boy. His father was this raging alcoholic who would beat up anything and anybody in his sight. His mom was so depressed, she spent most of her days in bed, unable to get up the energy to cook meals for the boys. And his older brother, Danny, was his idol. He tried to dress like Danny. He tried to act like Danny. He loved Danny. And Danny was the one who just abandoned his life. And as he's sharing this, the enormity of what it means for this boy begins to come to me. And after a while, he says, the reason I wanted to come is I have a question. Something really weird happened a few months ago. Dad came home. He was totally rocked. We had to get the hell out of there. So we went down the, the hill. We went to the liquor store. We got a couple of bottles of soda. And we just sat by a handball court in the elementary school, waiting until it was safe enough for us to go back to the house. And it was dark, and it was nighttime, and we're just sitting. We're not even talking. And all of a sudden, this shooting star shoots across the sky. And on an impulse, the two of them start wishing on this scar. And Danny says something like, boy, I wish I had a brand new car. And Tony says, I wish I had a brand new bike. And I wish I could play baseball like Willie Mays. I wish I could pitch like Juan Marichal. I wish that Regina had the hots for me. I wish Susie would leave me alone. I wish dad didn't drink so much. I wish mom wasn't so sad. I wish dad were dead. I wish mom just beat him up one time. I wish, I wish I were a long, long way away from here. And the way Tony described it, he didn't have an echo for that wish, because it was like Danny was, a long way away. Then he snaps back and he says, do you know what I wish? I wish that I could fly. And if I could fly, I would fly out of this world. I would fly through space until I found heaven. I would fly right until I found myself in front of God, and I would look God straight in the face. And what I wish is that God would smile. He takes his Coke bottle shatters it against a concrete wall and says, but that bastard would probably turn his back. And Tony looks to me and says, what I want to know, was he right? I mean, I know you can't, but if you could, if you could fly and see God's face, would God smile or would God turn God's back? Tony's question has haunted me through all these years because for me, he names, he gives voice, some longing that lies at the heart of every human being I've encountered in severe crisis. It comes out in different ways, but they are all asking something like, in the midst of the suicides, in the midst of the terminal diagnoses, in the midst of this life-stopping incarceration, am I alone? Is the universe cold and capricious? Is whatever I'm experiencing so despairing, so excruciating, so shaming perhaps, that whatever is sacred in this world recedes and abandons me? Or is there a presence? For me, we do this work because we know those spaces. We've been in those places asking that haunting question. 
We've known grief, despair. And we've known something else as well. That in the midst of the night of that pain, something sustained us. Some whisper of grace, whisper of care, of compassion, that enables us to be present to our own pain, which enables us to be present to another. It's miraculous that we know some sacred resource that allows us to be with the Tonys and Tanyas of the world. And being with them is the answer to their question. It is being that presence that is not turning its back, but holding and seeing and extending compassionate presence. And when we do that, we are aligned with the sacred compassionate energy of the universe. That's why we do what we do. And that's what sustains us. One of the invitations of compassion is to remember the sources of our own call and vocation and to be reconnected, deeply connected to them, because that's what sustains us in the work that we do. Second way, compassion offers resilience. And that is that self-compassion is actually the source of self-restoration. When we are feeling disconnected from our resources, when we feel far away from our capacities to offer the kind of compassionate care we feel called to embody, it is actually self-compassion that is the healing agent that restores us to our resources, that restores us to our best self. Let me describe how we understand this work at the Center for Engaged Compassion. Let me start with a little story. So, so when my son Justin was like eight months old, he's 27, this was years and years ago, uh, he was at this age where he'd just like sit in his stroller and he would just love to take the world in. He just was wide-eyed looking at everybody and we were at a mall visiting grandparents and all the other uh, family members are shopping and we weren't really into shopping. So I'm walking him through the courtyards of the mall, him and his stroller, and he's just looking at everybody and I lean up against a planter and I'm just kind of rocking him and I look off to the side, and here comes this woman walking towards us. And what's more striking about her, she's probably retirement age, is that she is as hard and angry and upset as I could imagine. Her whole face is tight. Her jaw is clenched. She is scowling, and her head is twitching as she is bulldozing her way through the mall towards us. I don't know what she got jilted by somebody, or she's going to chew somebody out, but she was upset. People are getting out of her way because she's getting out of her way for nobody, right? Handbags clenched, shopping bags clenched, oh, she's marching. What I don't realize is Justin's sitting in his stroller, he's looking at her too. <laughs> she's twitching her head, bulldozing her way towards us. She gets close, she doesn't break stride, but as she gets near, her head twitches off to the side. She sees Justin, and for a moment, their eyes lock. And Justin does the craziest thing. He smiles. And the second he smiles, all of the hardness of this woman, it melted away. She got on her knees, dropped her bags, and for several minutes, the two of them are giggling and smiling at each other. She's tickling him under the arm. He's grabbing after her glasses. It is like mirrors of unconditional delight in the beauty of each other. And after a while, as they're just beaming this love to each other, she looks up at me, notices that I'm standing there too, and she says, God bless him. God bless him. And God bless you too. She grabs her bags and she walks away. One of the things that our research has confirmed is something that many contemplative spiritual traditions have known all along. And that is that we have innate capacities for compassion. We are wired to care. Attachment theorists have confirmed this as well. Babies need compassionate connection to thrive as much as we need air to breathe. And it's wired into us. Justin himself at eight months old is seeking compassionate connection with another human being. 
And we all have those capacities. It's who we are when we are in our essence, when we are in our best self, when we are in touch with that core of how we were created to be, we are compassionate. It's like when all the hardness can melt away, it just arises and emerges. She doesn't need, that woman doesn't need a little manual. What do you do when a baby smiles at you in a mall? Well, you kind of tickle them under the arm and you might grab for the glasses. No, when the hardness goes, compassion just flows freely and fully. That essence goes by different names uh, of the Buddha nature within us, the Imago Dei within us. Rumi called it the beloved lover that lies like an immortal diamond deep in every soul. And that capacity for compassion, that essence of care, it beats like a pilot light of the human spirit in every single human being. It even beats in Damien. Damien is a gentleman who was part of a program that Ruth Gordon initiated. I don't know if you know Ruth Gordon. She started the Roots of Empathy Project in Toronto. And what Ruth Gordon discovered was that there were ways that you can cultivate empathy in school children. And what she would do is she would actually bring a, a parent with a young infant or a child, a toddler, into the class and allow the classmates to interact with the, with the baby. Well, Damien, Damien was an eighth grader. Um, he was already fully tattooed and, and um, uh, piercings all over his body. He had been passed in and out of foster homes, institutions since he was four years old. He was aggressive to the point of being assaultive that he was gonna need to go to a reform school. He could not pay attention. He was constantly batting forth about what they had to do. And the reason for all of his aggression and hostility was well known to the teachers. When he was four years old, he watched his father kill his mother in front of him. His mother dead, his father sent to prison. He was passed around from institution after institution, none of them able to contain him with all of his rage until he's now an assault away from reform school. Nobody conferred with Damien about Ruth Gordon coming to class that day, and he was having none of it. The teacher says, that's fine. You just go ahead and go into the corner and, and watch a video. Don't worry about it. We're going to do the rest of the kids are going to do this program. And so for a while, the baby is being passed around, and they have it on a blanket, and all the kids are gooing and gawing, and, and it's cultivating their capacities for, for empathy and compassion. Until it's time that the baby's starting ready to go to sleep. She's tired. And so the mom picks up the baby and says, I'm going to need to put her down. And Damien walks over from the corner and says, excuse me, but can I put the baby to sleep? And the teacher's thinking, no. <laughs> but the mom kind of trusts her own instinct and says, well, sure. And so they put a snuggly on Damien. And then they put the baby into the snuggly. And instantly, he just starts to rock and just tap the baby. The baby looks up at the mom to see if it's okay, and it is. And the baby closes her eyes and goes to sleep on his chest. And Damien starts walking around. Look, look, I put her to sleep. Isn't that cool? I put her to sleep. And after a while, it's time for the mom to go tenderly passes the baby back to the mom. And as she's getting her things, he goes up to the teacher and he says, tell me, do you think it's possible to be a good dad even if you've never been loved in your life? Even through all the brutalities that this young man has endured in his life, the understandable hardness and aggressiveness that he has learned to protect himself with, still deep down there beats this capacity for compassion. It beats in us all. And when we are in that essence, when we are restored back to our best self, compassion is relatively easy. It flows naturally. 
And we may experience this. When we're at the top of our game, we're going into the hospital or we're going to the prison or we're going to the school and we're in our zone, we're feeling good. We feel expansive. We feel grounded. We feel ready and open to people's experience. And, and if somebody shared something difficult, our heart would be moist and soft, ready to receive that. The problem is the times when we are not in that essence, when we are not in that grounded flow. Sometimes we show up to work and we're feeling exhausted and depleted. We're feeling overwhelmed or we're feeling despairing or we're feeling irritated at the dynamics, the political dynamics that are going on at work or we're distracted by the burdens that we're carrying from home. Or sometimes we show up to work and we feel just fine and then we encounter that person that has the capacity to trigger all the anxiety in us. No, don't send me to that patient, please, right? Or that coworker that just knows what to say or the supervisor or the bureaucrat and they get under our skin and we're activated and now we've got to go extend to compassion to somebody, right? And what we normally do when we get hijacked, knocked off of our center, what spiritual directors, they call these interior movements, our numbness, our anxieties, our irritations, what we normally do is we try to suppress it. We try to grit our teeth and suck up an energy, a feigned niceness that we can give to people. And that is exhausting. That's what leads to burnout. We're extending fumes that we don't have within us. One of the invitations of self-compassion is when that happens, to not beat ourselves up, not judge ourselves, not try to push and suppress, not try to manage away what is happening in our interior life, because that doesn't work. First of all, it's a form of interior violence, right? I'm beating myself up because I'm irritated at my boss, and yet I'm going to go in and be nice and compassionate to somebody, right? It's like screaming my way into silence, right? Straining my way to be relaxed. It is counterproductive. Not only that, it doesn't work, right? What happens with our irritations or our exhaustions and our numbness? We just try to pretend that we don't feel them. It's like pushing a buoy underwater. It just keeps popping back up. And the reason is because there is a spiritual invitation present in our own interior reactivities. And this is the game changer for self-compassion. Every one of our interior movements and interior states is there for a reason. They are rooted in some deep needs that are aching to be heard, aching to be met, so that we can have the resources where we are grounded and strong and safe and resilient and open. It's like our numbness, our exhaustion, our anger, our anxiety, our little flags inside of us, aching to get our attention, aching for us to, to turn inward and say, whoa, what's going on? What do you need from me right now? The invitation of self-compassion, we call it taking the U-turn. When I'm not in that grounded essence and I'm feeling agitated or numb, just take a moment and take the U-turn. Turn inward and just notice what is going on. Don't judge. Don't suppress. Just be contemplatively aware. And then be curious and treat ourselves like we would treat another human being who comes in and says, you know what, I've got to go give compassion to this patient, but I'm just so angry at my boss. We wouldn't say, well, you know, a good chaplain wouldn't be so angry. What's wrong with you, right? <laughs> just swallow that anger and put it away, right? And go be compassionate. We don't do that, but we do that to ourselves. The radical invitation of self-compassion is to not, when we get hijacked, to not judge, but to turn inward and become mindfully aware of what's happening within us and then listen for the cry that is hidden underneath. Let me give an example, purely hypothetical. 
So I might do a lot of speaking and lead a lot of retreats and I'm away for two weeks and working every single day and I come home on a Sunday. Maybe I'm even flying, say, from the East Coast and uh, I arrive on a Sunday evening and it's about 10 o'clock and it's been a good week. I'm feeling really good, but I'm tired. And as, as soon as the plane lands, I turn on my cell phone and there's a voicemail from my sister, Michelle, in Las Vegas. Frank, I don't care what time it is. You gotta call me. It's a crisis. Call now. And compassionate man that I am, I go, no, Michelle, come on. You've got to be kidding. Why do you always come to me? Take care of it yourself. What is wrong with you? Don't ask me to call you right now. And then, of course, I go, look at you, Mr. Compassion Man, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't tell this to people when you're talking about compassion. They'll realize you're a fraud. I mean, a real person of compassion would have compassion and call yourself, I know, but no, no, I'm exhausted, right? So these are two interior movements that are having a little battle, trying to take over the bus of my consciousness. Uh, for those of you who know who internal family systems work that informs a lot of what we do, these are just two parts. A part of me that is exhausted and a part of me that's beating myself up. I should be a good big brother. Two parts that are fighting for control. The invitation of self-compassion is just catch our breath for a moment and then turn inward and just notice. So what's going on? Let me just breathe and be aware that there are these energies here, an energy of exhaustion and an energy of guilt. Okay, let me just be with them. But then let me listen to them. Each is a cry, aching to be met. What is this groan saying no? What's this deep longing? I'm tired, I've been working for days, I need a break. I need space to regroup, of course. And this guilt, what's its deep cry? I love my sister. Of course I want to be for her. Of course I want to be a comfort and a source. But I want to do it when I'm really available and I'm not faking my way. OK, so what might I do now? that honors both needs. And notice, I'm getting reconnected to my true self. I'm grounded again. I'm internally calibrated again. My reactivity has relaxed, and I'm available to my resources. You know what? There's all kinds of things I could do. I could call her up and say, yeah, I can talk with you right now, but tomorrow I'm canceling all my appointments. I'm spending the day in the woods. or. I might text her and say, you know, Michelle, I really want to be with you. I want to when I'm really available. I'll call you at 10, but I have to get a night's sleep before I can. It doesn't matter, but I'm acting from a different space. Self-compassion is restorative, and it helps us access our resources, from which we are the best caregivers. OK, number three. I don't know why I even write down notes. I never look at them. <laughs> Third way that compassion is a resource of, for resilience. And that is that compassion for others is actually the antidote to burnout. Compassion is the cure to compassion fatigue. Now, I know this sounds counterintuitive, right? I mean, we think. Compassion is what does fatigue us. It is pouring ourselves out and offering ourselves and absorbing people's pain. But in truth, that's not what the research shows. The research shows that compassion is not depleting, it's replenishing. That compassion, when we are in genuine compassion, is actually physically, emotionally, and spiritually restorative. It does not lead to exhaustion and fatigue. So what's going on? Well, the issue is we have a false understanding of compassion, and we confuse it with empathy. The leading researcher 
today on empathy is Tanya Singer. Maybe some of you know her. She's a social neuroscientist. And she's very interested in studying uh, the neurophysiology involved in pro-social emotions. Um, and so empathy was her primary research topic for a number of years. And what she found, what empathy is, it is when we are emotionally affected by the emotional affect of another. It is when we feel their pain when we take that on and experience that. And what she found was in the brain, she actually found where empathy is located. When we see somebody's pain, we feel pain. The part of our brain that gets activated is the part that activates when we are in the same kind of pain. So there, it's a mirroring process that's happened. They call it affective isomorphism, right? We are feeling a similar feeling. We feel some, see somebody's joy. The way we feel joy and the joy we know gets activated and that parts of our brain happens, right? So she's studying all this and she writes on this and, and realizes that this is what empathy is, right? So, and, and this happens to us all, right? I mean, we, take, we know how to be emotionally attuned to folks. This is the stock of our trade as caregivers, right? We see a person that is in pain and we wince, right? We, we take that pain, we, oh yeah, I feel that pain. Right? Or we, somebody's just morally outraged, do you know what happened today? And we go, yeah, that's right, I'm morally outraged too, right? It's empathy, it is a mirroring of the emotion. Right? A teenager just won a soccer game and celebrating and has joy, and we feel joy and enthusiasm too. It's, it's empathy, we are mirroring the pains, right? Empathy is not compassion. But Tanya Singer didn't know that. So she gets a research grant to study compassion, and she, meets a, a Buddhist monk, his name is Matthew Ricard. Matthew Ricard had a PhD himself in molecular biology and at a young age gave it all away, moved to India and joined a, a, a community there and has been a, a Buddhist monk ever since, some 40, 50 years. Matthew Ricard is the one that Richie Davison studied at the University of Wisconsin when they were trying to notice the brain activity of monks when they were practicing contemplative practices. Um, beautiful, beautiful research. So Tanya Singer gets Matthew Ricard and she says, I have access to a live MRI machine. So that is, I can put you in a machine, you can experience something, do a practice, and I can watch live time what's happening in your brain. Would you be willing to help me with a study on compassion? Absolutely puts him in the machine and says, okay, practice compassion. And she's looking at her, at her brain scans and he's not feeling compassion, right? She knows what compassion is. It's at the empathy part of the brain. It's not lighting up, right? She waits, she waits. What's the matter with this guy? Is he thinking about lunch? Is he distracted? <laughs> he comes on out. He says, uh, so what was going on? What were you doing? She goes, well, I was feeling compassion. You were feeling, you, are we sure you weren't thinking about something else? Thinking about, are you hungry? Are you tired? No, no, I was doing the meta compassion prayer. I was feeling compassion, deep, profound compassion. So she's trying to test this out. And so are you saying that you were feeling the suffering of some people? No, I wasn't feeling their suffering. I was feeling compassion. Is it possible for you to feel the suffering of another? Well, sure it is. Well, let's try that. Put it back in, a machine. And so apparently he had watched a BBC documentary the night before about some Romanian children who were in an orphanage. They were underfed. They were emaciated. They had that vacant stare of, of the shell-shocked, traumatized. And he starts thinking about them. And all of a sudden, the empathy part of his brain lights up. In fact, it goes bangbusters, right? He goes, ah, he can feel compassion, right? She notices it, measures it. And then brings him back out. Thank you. Yes, okay, that worked. He says, okay, yeah, but you're not going to leave me there, are you? Said, what do you mean, leave you there? You're feeling compassion. No, I wasn't feeling compassion. I was feeling their pain. It's exhausting. It's overwhelming. I'm taking it into my system. Please, don't leave me there. Let me feel compassion. Well, all right, let's put you back in and try that. <laughs> and he starts, there's the empathy again. Yeah, he still feels their pain. And then all of a sudden, it starts to subside. It doesn't go away. It's still there, but just enough that he's emotionally connected. And then this whole other part of the brain lights up that she didn't even notice the first time. It's the part of the brain that releases oxytocin. It's the part of the brain that is active when, when parents are, are gazing upon their children when they're sleeping at night. It's, it's the part of the brain that got activated in the mall when that woman saw Justin smiling at her. It's this warm rush. It's the part of the brain that gets activated when we fall in love and we see our beloved. It's a regenerative, restorative feeling. 
that changes everything inside. It's the attachment affiliative systems that are being accessed, not the pain systems and the protective systems that then get enacted. And so Tanya Singer starts studying compassion and its relationship to empathy. And what she's discovered is that empathy is a necessary precondition for compassion. We need to be able to feel another person's experience. We need to be able to get, get it at some level, but just enough. Not that we're absorbing it and taking all of it in. That when that happens, there's two possibilities. We could just allow that pain to be absorbed and then we go into empathic distress. Our body starts acting. We release cortisol in our system. And that leads to things like, like poor health. Our immune system goes down. We have a harder time sleeping. Emotional regulation is more difficult. We're more irritable. We're less present to our loved ones. Is this ringing a bell, right? This is compassion fatigue. This is burnout. And if we're in there long enough, then our protective systems kick in. Protective systems like, I'm going to avoid this pain. I'm going to numb myself out when I go back into that situation. I'm going to hope that I get some other pick when I don't have to go on those rounds in, in that particular ward. We're going to withdraw. We're going to recede. We might attack people. We might start getting into fix-it mode just to make it all go away so we don't have to face it anymore, none of which are compassion. right? It's our own protectiveness to escape the distress of our empathy. Compassion, on the other hand, is a completely different affective experience. And it is evolutionary, the evolutionary value is that it saves us. It's an antidote to empathic distress. That when we start to take on someone's pain, we can activate a warm, loving regard towards a person. That feels completely different than taking on their distress. We can pay attention to the other with clarity and be aware of the meaning and the experience of them, not confusing it with our own. Compassion then is a capacity that in opens up an intention to want to ease their suffering in some way, but out of a pro-social motivation and in a way that's not attached to the outcome. We're going to offer our care, but we don't know what's going to happen. They may die. They may not get out of prison. But that does not disable us from our compassionate resources. So she has an article called Compassion Fatigue or Empathic Distress Fatigue. The gift that is offered to caregivers is to not just cultivate the capacities of empathy, but to transform that empathy into compassion. And when we do that, the empathy levels of our brain are stabilized. Our cortisol levels relax. We're able to feel grounded again, not swept up in the pain of the moment. We develop a resiliency of being able to be aware of our own reactivities, but also be able to set them aside and tend to them later. And then we can focus our attention on the other and activate a warm, loving regard that is restorative. We call it breathe, bracket, and behold. When we're taking on too much pain or we're too activated, just breathe. Let me just catch my breath. Let me restabilize. Let me bracket. Let me be aware. OK, something's going on in me. I'm going to need to attend to this when I meditate after this is over. I'm going to bracket it for now. And then behold the other. Put our attention on them and truly pay attention to their experience and their meaning while activating a loving regard that's just sending like a warm energy of care towards these people. Tanya Singer has discovered that that kind of energy is restorative. We get tired at the end of a day of that, but it's the exhilarating tired of after going on a long run or, or making music or dancing or, or creating art. It's a weariness that feels exhilarating, that we do need to sleep and tend to our bodies, of course. 
but our resiliency comes back quickly because our resources have been sustained as opposed to being fatigued and burned out. So she suggests compassion is restorative, which may make a lot of sense to us because as we remember places where we embody that kind of compassionate care, when I'm in that lobby of the, of the hospital, when I'm standing around that circle of care with my mother-in-law, when I'm in the car with an 11-year-old boy, I'm in touch, I'm connected to the sources of compassion that inspire my work and sustain me in the first place. I'm aligned with that energy that is personally restorative. And I am plugged into some sacred energy of cosmic compassion that permeates through our world and is flowing through us, offering persons a little glimpse of that infinite compassion that sees it all, holds it all, and sustains us all through it. That's why we do what we do. Okay. <laughs> so I have some time for the little dialogue. Any questions and responses or curious how this resonates or? Hi, thank Hi. you so much for your presentation. I noticed that many of your stories um, include children, babies, small children, up through middle school, high school age, and I wonder um, if you have any thoughts of what we can learn from perhaps having a childlike mind um, or childlike perspective in able to access certain emotions or um, streams of caring or openness in our work. Yeah, yeah. I, I, well, I think, I mean, we're wired for compassion and connection, and, and it's natural and available for young children unless they've been wounded along the way. And we, we all are wounded in, in some ways, and then some of us are wound, wounded in much deeper ways, and those capacities are more, more difficult. But children seem to have be, that capacity to be able to access that rather quickly. And part of it is also is, is the, uh, the defensive protective mechanisms are not as fully entrenched either. So that when those kick in, and they, of course they do. I mean, children get upset and, you know, they can have their say and sit for a second, and then it's, okay, I'm not, and I'm ready to go play again, right? So they're able to kind of recalibrate quickly. And we have a lot to learn about that kind of capacity, yeah. Leslie, can you, um, yeah. I echo the thanks for this wonderful presentation. I find myself thinking about um, developmental capacity and the ability to do that nuanced distinguish distinguishing between empathy and compassion is something that um, is a skill set, actually. Mm -hmm. And that a lot of what you're talking about and probably what your training is and a lot of what we try to do in things like CPE and reflective education is developing that capacity to notice what's going on inside, similar with internal family systems, see the parts, and then tap, figure out what you're gonna do with those parts or, those, or that incredibly powerful empathic reaction, the capacity to um, choose mm -hmm. how to use it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, um, and I think children are wide open to the world in that beautiful way, and then the task of adulthood is figuring out how to manage that open-heartedness, mm -hmm. to use it to not be hurt by it, which happens, um, or, or to choose to be impacted by it. So I just found myself thinking about, you know, the, the, this is kind of higher order stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, so those, that's what was going on in my mind as you were yeah, talking. Yeah, thank, thank you. you, thank you. I, yeah, it really resonates with my experience too. I mean, these are, these are skills. These are muscles that can be developed. And, and for like the work that we do, they are some of the most essential muscles to develop, to teach ways that we, when we are activated, to be able to get grounded again and restabilized and tend to our own internal needs and be able to access our resources for others. And, um, and those are all practices. There are spiritual practices that help do that and emotional practices. 
Um, there are also practices for children too. I mean, emotional intelligence and emotional awareness and helping children be able to, when they are feeling an emotion, take that little moment in their own way to be reflective. Okay, so what are you feeling? Can you point to it? And okay, this is anger or this is excitement or whatever. And, and you're, we're cultivating in a developmentally appropriate way the same types of thing. And, and also practices for children that, that can cultivate compassion for others and you know, perspective taking. So yeah, that really resonates. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I was curious about your story about coming fr off the plane and um, getting the voicemail. Um, when you described the U-turn, um, I feel like sometimes I have two responses when I do that U-turn. One is that I kind of stew in the feeling and I don't actually get any, I just kind of stew. And then the other is like, um, I acknowledge the feeling, but then I quickly, it becomes managing it so that I can get whatever I need done done. Neither of which feel like what you described, where you, you, your needs were genuinely met. So I'm curious, how do you um, balance like being proactive but not, yeah, stewing, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, what an what a insightful uh, awareness of your own internal process, right? So, so that, that's right. That's different than what I'm talking about, but it happens all the time. So, um, so I can have this feeling of groaning, and if I take the U-turn, if I'm just groaning and stewing in that, then, then I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just doing that. I'm just spinning my wheels around in the mud, right? And so the, the practice, the skill that, that, is, uh, that we're invited to, to develop is that capacity to be able to step back from, kind of internally step back from the emotion and develop more a contemplative awareness of the emotion, kind of like what mindfulness might do. Um, and, and it takes some work. It takes, you know, and there's a lot of little tricks that we might do around doing that. We might just kind of breathe for a moment. We might just kind of feel ourselves in a chair and just kind of get ourselves stabilized. We might try to imagine uh, uh, that, that anger or whatever as, as a color or as a little child and we might place it over here. We might get a little object. We might draw it. There are all kinds of little tricks that we might do to help us get a little bit of distance, a little separation, so that I can have the emotion, but I not am the emotion. Um, and so that is absolutely one of the uh, prerequisites or one of the skill sets that we're invited to do so that I can quickly kind of recalibrate when that happens. And, and as you notice, once I do that, okay, so I've got this, uh, this groan that doesn't want to take care of my sister. Okay, I could be aware of that. I'm not in it anymore. Then the question is, am I in my best self? Am I in a place where I really am open to hearing what's that groan, what the cry is underneath that? Um, or has another part taken over? A part that wants to manage it, make it go away, um, and and so I do another internal barometer check. Am I really open to hearing the cry? Well, no. To be honest, I wish it would just go away. I wish it would just leave me alone. I got to do what I got to do as a big brother. Okay. So now I'm spiraling in another one of those inner energies. So I got to do the same thing. Let me take a little step back from that one. Okay. So we got two here that are going on until I find myself kind of backing into that grounded contemplative awareness that is genuinely open to hearing both. And then they're willing to relax a bit because now they're not being managed or um, just acting out. And what is underneath them can begin to surface if we hold them long enough. So it's, it's a practice, yeah, but that's spot on, right? Well, I, I um, have to lead us all in giving our gratitude and thanks to thanks.